Hi guys, welcome to our fourth lecture in our series of lectures on model-driven engineering and uh, MAST uh, model assisted software development. Um, so we were supposed to, on this lecture, supposed to proceed to the next chapter, which starts to describe some of the entities in our problem domain, uh, which is software engineering really. But I'd like to do a bit of a preamble before we get there. Um, and this is sort of a philosophical uh, discussion rather than a more practical discussion. Um, the reason why I think this is important is because when we're dealing with a topic such as model-driven engineering, uh, you exit the normal space of software engineering. Um, most of the time when we're just coding, we focus a lot on the problem domain and we focus a lot on engineering a solution to a problem. But once you start to deal with fundamental concepts such as modeling, and once you start to go down um, that abstraction ladder, you start to notice a lot of connections between uh, philosophical questions and computer science and software engineering problems. And so I'd like to, to do that preamble first before we uh, get further down this. I, I don't, I'm going to weave some thoughts here that are probably not fully formed, um, and I'm sure there will be quite a lot of uh, basic mistakes on them. This is not something that I'll attempt to discuss during my uh, PhD uh, viva, but I think it's important to capture these ideas because I think um, we have lost a little bit the connection that we used to have uh, in, from software engineering to these philosophical questions. We worry a lot about implementation detail and pragmatism, as we've seen, but um, sometimes we lose, we lose a little bit the full picture of where we are um, in, in the, the broader sense of the of the academic and uh, philosophical world. So uh, the, the, the reason why I got interested in this was uh, there was a lot of interesting questions raised by a lot of the researchers in the field. Uh, George is a classic one. Uh, I can't really pronounce his name properly. It's a Scandinavian name, so I guess we George, something like that. Uh, but I'll just say George is the Portuguese way. Um, so George was hinting at the notion that um, we all seem to know what a model is, but we don't really seem to have a generally accepted definition of a model. Um, now, you could argue with this and you could say, well, actually, we already know what we mean by a model. This is something formal, um, something that conforms to a meta model and so on. But I think George was trying to hint at something even deeper than that. He was basically trying to say that he expected there to be um, a theory of modeling in the same way that there is a theory of uh, called compiler theory, for instance. In other words, a fairly standard way uh, of describing a problem uh, in a way that enables you to apply formal methods to determine whether a solution is valid or not. Um, these days, if you talk about compilers to pretty much any computer scientist or software engineer, um, everyone will understand when you talk about an abstract syntax tree, everything, everyone knows what uh, parsing, uh, what a lexer is. Um, yeah, these are all concepts that are fairly well, very well understood by anyone dealing with compilers, even, even those of us that don't actually do uh, compiler programming or compiler engineering for a living. We all have an understanding of these very basic terms. And there is no need for us to, to have uh, engage on an argument uh, as to what exactly is a compiler or what constitutes a compiler and so on. Um, whilst model engineering is quite old, perhaps not as old as compilers, but still, um, at least three decades, depends how we measure its inception, but uh, it's fairly old. Um, we still don't have um, that level of um, um, st stability in terms of terminology and concepts and so on. And George was asking whether that is something that is, must exist in order for this field to progress. Um, and I think, I slightly disagree with George's, I think that there will never be a uh, model theory in the sense that there is compiler theory. Of course, one could say um, we already have model theory. Of course, if you can read German, which sadly I can't, but if you could read Stakowiak, you will find a, a general model theory, right? That's what Stakowiak wrote about. Uh, but he didn't write it from a software engineering perspective. He wrote about it from a philosophical perspective. Um, what George was asking for was for the computer science version of it, which um, an architecture, a, a framework, and uh, of similar stand to what we have with compilers. 
And personally, I don't think that that will ever happen. Uh, the reason why I don't think that's possible is because I don't think it's possible to create formal models for models. Um, the power of models and the power of the neocortex comes precisely from its lack of formalism. And to understand why I think that way, uh, we need to do a little bit of digging. Um, and as someone once told me, uh, if you dig far enough, eventually you'll reach Russell. Everyone seems to always come back to Russell. So Bertrand Russell spent a lot of time thinking about these questions. Um, of course, he wasn't a computer scientist or a software engineer. He was a mathematician, a logician, of all things. Um, and he was worried about the foundations of mathematics. His objective was to try to create uh, sound foundations for mathematics, to, to create a very, very, very small set of axioms, and from those axioms derive pretty much all of mathematics, and then to uh, ensure that those axioms were sound by um, everyone's agreement, I guess. Now, I'm not a mathematician, so of course I, I will say lots of things here that are technically probably not correct, but it's more important to understand the gist of what was trying to, to, to be achieved rather than the specifics. Um, so, of course, we now know as well that Russell was, um, his, his idea was not feasible. Goodall and so many other people afterwards demonstrated that this idea of creating a complete um, version of maths and, and, you know, that there, there are certain limits to the, the capabilities of mathematics that you just can't transcend. That it, those are very, very fundamental questions about the actual nature of maths. Um, but I don't think we need to concern ourselves with that level of precision. Um, I mean, it, it is very likely, if you know lots about compilers, and I'm not a person to talk about this, but I'm sure that you would probably say that it is not possibly possible to formally prove for every construction, um, for every source code input, that the, the output is going to be well formed. Um, I'm sure there, is, there are mathematical limits in, in demonstrating that. And we still have a very strong theory of compilers that's very, very useful, and we can use it on a daily basis to generate lots and lots of code. And it's very, it's inf infrequent that you run into problems of those fundamental theoretical limitations. Um, so I don't think uh, necessarily the things that concern, concern the very um, edges of mathemat mathematics are of importance to regular software engineering. Uh, just because there is a fundamental limit in something in terms of maths, does not mean that in terms of engineering that's an actual urgent problem. So if we, if we were in that kind of realm of, of compiler theory, uh, I think we'd be in a very good ground um, because that, that's more than sufficient to, 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 to create tools to do engineering with. The problem with models is, is that we are very, very far away from that. And um, the reason why I think we are goes to the heart of the question of what we mean by language because um, modeling and language are actually, um, it, it, we are talking about the same subject in different ways. Um, and, and to talk about that, I think we need to go to another very important character that again links back to Russell, which is Wittgenstein. Now, I'm, I'm a very big fan of Wittgenstein. Now, I don't claim to say I understand Wittgenstein, but the, the few ideas that I, met, I was able to glean from Wittgenstein's thought seem to be extremely intriguing. And so, um, and even the way he attacked the philosophical questions is very intriguing. So Wittgenstein spent a lot of time understanding what Russell was doing with Principia and this highly formalized uh, way of defining maths. Um, very, um, a very formal and correct, I guess you could say, way of defining um, all concepts uh, around this, this particular topic. And Wittgenstein, on his first philosophy, which was... Uh, written out in a, in a book called the Tractatus, um, a book that I must say is very impenetrable, but if you read the commentary of the Tractatus, then, then it becomes slightly more uh, understandable. What Wittgenstein was proposing was, um, in effect, that language is what um, uh, Kevin Henney described as a serialization of what's happening in the real world. Um, in effect, you would use language to construct a series of propositions and you could at all times evaluate whether those propositions were true or false because there'll be some kind of correspondence, some kind of mapping between those propositions in the real world. And once that correspondence broke down, then you entered the realm of nonsense. And I mean quite literally nonsense as in it does not make any sense. Um, it is not to say that those statements would not have a place in Wittgenstein's view of the world. 
It's just that those statements belong to uh, a part of language that was um, separate from the part of language with meaning, containing meaning. Meaning, again, being described by this evaluation of, of uh, propositions and sentences and so on. And so this, this first version of Wittgenstein translates quite well to the world that we're used to living in uh, as computer scientists. Because when you create a program, if you do not write a, a series of commands that are considered to be valid according to the language, that program is nonsensical. Um, it is still entirely possible for you to create all sorts of constructs that are uh, not particularly clever, I guess. But they will have to at least be valid according to the parser. And, and Wittgenstein's ideas are kind of a bit like that. Um, that, that these sentences that you make are uh, true or false. There is some kind of notion of absolute truth that somehow you could always evaluate. Um, and again, this is as far as I understand this philosophy, which is obviously a very limited understanding, given that I'm not a philosopher. Um, the, this, this view of the world um, was the early Wittgenstein. The late Wittgenstein, it, it, it almost takes on a completely diametrically opposed view of the world, in that he, he thinks that language itself, first, it, it starts to make this conflation or this, this conjunction that knowledge and language and um, th th there's a bundle of things that are all together and it cannot be s set apart. It's not like your brain has got a bit of, of, of information that's uh, structured outside of language and then you convert that into language to serialize that to thoughts uh, somewhere else. The late Wittgenstein instead um, creates this, this realm of language where um, the meaning of the word and the word become bundled together. Um, and furthermore, the way we understand each other is by uh, this notion of language games. Um, and by that, we don't really mean like playing football, but we mean games in the sense of uh, something where a set of participants agrees to um, obey a set of rules and to um, behave according to those rules. Um, the difference between the Wittgenstein language game and a typical game is that this game is completely dynamic. So um, as the participants evolve and as their understanding of things such as the real world change, so does do the rules of the game. Uh, in other words, we could agree to call something X, but then over time we can then say that actually that's called Y. And, and as long as all participants within the game agree to that, uh, then the, the game just naturally evolves to this next state. And in addition, it is important to understand that these language games are not just the, the fact that we all speak English or we all, um, certain subsets of people speak certain dialects and so on. I think, as I understand it, what Wittgenstein meant was every group of people, um, these this subsets or these language games, they're all quite distinct. So, for instance, a set of computer scientists would play one language game and perhaps a set of biologists play another language game. And the language game is, in effect, the body of terms and um, how they are used in practice, this is the very important part, how they are used in practice within that group, that is what defines the grouping of the language game. Now, this sounds all very abstract, so um, I'm going to, this is going to be a bit of an arc of my argument. Um, in effect, I think, what Wittgenstein is trying to say is that knowledge is actually, instead of being formal, knowledge is, is almost by definition, informal. And if we were to translate Wittgenstein's thinking to um, what we now know, uh, and by that I mean uh, after the work of Sokoviak, after the work uh, that we, uh, after the work of Hofstadter, and um, the knowledge we gained from Hawking in terms of computational neuroscience and so on. What seems to me that Wittgenstein was trying to say was that modeling and talking are not two distinct activities. In fact, they are just the one activity. We're always, at all times, modeling. Um, when you create a word, that word is a model of something. Um, and the, the neocortex is a modeling machine. It's fundamentally, all it does, all the time, is to do models. And it does predictions, and here I'm, I'm using Hawking's, so I will re reference this in a second, but uh, here I'm using Hawking's, the neocortex is, is in this feedback loop of creating a model, evaluating the model's performance against whatever you want to call reality, 
I, I don't really want to use the word reality because I think it's a misnomer here, but some kind of observable state. And then correcting the model to become more compatible to what it is observing. Um, and this, this is a constant loop that happens. And it's not just in the sense of um, uh, observing, uh, I don't know, our football players play in the pitch or something like that. I mean, everything you do, how your fingers move, um, uh, when you're looking at something, you, your neocortex is every second is doing some kind of observation and some kind of comparison of the predicted state versus the observed state. And in, internally, the ne neocortex then translates that, um, that loop into a better prediction. And, and that model, that, that fundamental model, is completely pervasive inside of the neocortex. Um, and so here I'm going to do a few references. So, well, first I would like to correct myself. When I said um, Russell, I really mean Russell and Whitehead. Now, I don't really have any books from um, Russell, so I'll just instead show uh, Whitehead's uh, book, which is Process and Reality. This is a very um, deep book. I haven't quite managed to read it properly. Uh, instead, I relied on a few lectures on this. I think that Whitehead um, deals with a lot of the problems um, that come out of Russell's very strict and stringent way of looking at the world. And his views on process and reality are very, very interesting. Uh, there is a talk by um, someone whose name I forget at the moment, but uh, where he discusses Whitehead quite deeply. I'll link that on the, on the video description. Um, and I think it makes a lot of sense uh, what, he, what he's talking about there, but I'm not going to get too much into that. All, all, all I'm trying to say is that I think Whitehead is as important as Russell, not just because of the work he did with Russell originally in Principia, but also because of the process um, philosophy that he did further on, uh, which I think is in direct response to that rigid way of looking at the world that Russell had. The second uh, book I'd like to mention as well is GEB. And um, GEB from Hofstadter, this is a strange book, but in a way, it's a very profound book, I think. Uh, I've read it a couple of times, and I can't say, I can't say that I actually understood it, but um, what I did understand about it is everything... It, I think there are two key concepts that Hofstadter tries to explain. Um, one is recursion, uh, things defined in terms, of itself, in terms of itself, and the second thing is analogies. Uh, if I was to try to simplify what I understood of this book, I would say those two things were the things that jumped to me. And what I mean by this is, um, Hofstad seems to imply that we create these connections between concepts in our brain all the time. And intelligence, in, in some ways, is the ability to create these connections of things that, at first sight, look very different. Um, so, for instance, understanding a poem is a classic case. Of course, you probably say, well, you can create poems using ML. The problem with ML is that the loop... ML, in many ways, is an imitation game, I think. ML is very good, given a set of examples, it's very good at distilling some fundamental characteristics of those examples, and then um, replicating the training set, creating novel uh, entries. And of course, if you then use a GAN, you can then say, you can make the, 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 the generated set extremely realistic. Uh, because by adversarial means, you can ensure that uh, the error between the training set and the output set, the generated set, becomes smaller and smaller, and, and so that the end result produced by the, by the neural network is actually extremely close um, to things that you observe in the real world, giving us the impression that there is some, something bigger than just a set of algorithms executing. It almost seems like ML is becoming alive. But actually, I don't think that's the case. I think that given enough computing power, we can replicate things quite in a, in a very interesting way. But I do not think that the understanding that Offsider talks about will ever arise, from, from at least from this current architecture of uh, neural networks, because they lack the loop that I explained a second ago, where the neocortex um, first creates a prediction of something, and then... Um, observes whatever it is that it's observing, and dynamically, without any in interaction, uh, or with very little interaction, I guess, um, is able to self-correct and generate a new model. And also, the other very important thing about the neocortex is, the neocortex is completely fused uh, with the rest of your body. Um, so, it's 
the, the, the neural, neural networks as they work at present, they are not general purpose. Um, you may think that they are general purpose in the sense that as long as you can convert some images to, um, to some numeric representation, you can use that as input for your training set. But what I mean is the neocortex, well, if you think about it, just, just think about what we've learned to do as humans since the neocortex first came to be to until now. And you can see that the abilities that the neocortex has are vast. There is not just the, the case that humans were able to walk and use tools and so on, but it's also the case that we can send humans into space. And if you think of, I don't know, let's choose some arbitrary date for what we call the modern Homo sapiens. Let's imagine 300,000 years ago, we had the brain very similar to uh, well, the brain we have right now. So um, if that is the case, then the neocortex has reprogrammed itself over 300,000 years to generate what we have today without pretty much any other inputs other than the existing conditions in the world and other neocortexes. Um, and I do not think that's ever going to be possible with the current architecture of neural networks because the loop that the neural network has is not the same kind of loop as we've got with the neocortex. Which then leads me to the last reference I'd like to make, which is Hawkins. Um, I think that Hawkins work um, is going to be of great relevance in the future, I hope. Um, because I think it's taking a much more um, biologically inspired approach to neural networks. Um, so Hawkins and many other people uh, in the computational neuroscience field, they talk about this, the notion of an SDR, a sparse distributed representation. And for them, knowledge in the brain is represented um, as SDRs. You can think of SDRs as a snapshot of your brain at a point in time with a set of neurons that get, got activated um, and th those activations uh, represent a certain concept. Now, I'm going to make some examples here, which are very high level, just for lay, lay terms. But these are not precisely how you describe things. But let's imagine, for instance, you think of the word apple. Um, there will be a set of neurons in your brain. Um, and and what, I mean by, what I mean by a set of neurons, let's imagine that there's, um, in the context of this network, there is, I don't know, a thousand neurons or a, a hundred thousand neurons, say. Um, most of your neurons will be actually switched off. They'll be in a state where they're not um, active. But a very, very small percentage, maybe about 5% or something like that, will be in a pattern. And if you think of this pattern as a bitmap, um, you would see um, in this square of, I don't know, 100,000 or whatever um, set of neurons we got in a particular network, you'd see um, a few dots sprinkled here and there representing the particular concept of Apple. And what Hawkins tells us is that in the SDR, the particular location of those dots is not random. They, they have meaning. So unlike, say, a, a, a Turing machine where uh, it doesn't really matter where in memory you, represent, you put the bytes, um, you, there is no semantics. It's up to you as a programmer to structure your objects and to give meaning. And then when you read this particular bit pattern uh, and you read that out over to an object, you are reconstructing the meaning according to whatever you defined. Um, in the brain, things don't work that way, according to Hawkins and according to this approach of SDRs. In the brain, um, the bit patterns have meanings. And, and the joining, so the returning to offstyler, these analogies that we create in the brain, they are made by connecting um, different SDRs. So, for instance, let's say you've got the notion of an apple, and you have, as in apple, as in the fruit, and you have apple as in the company. If you were to take the two SDRs, you would see that there's a great amount of overlap between the two SDRs in terms of the bit pattern they both have. You'd also see a few things that are different between the two SDRs, showing that they're not the same. But the interesting thing is that part of it will be the same. And similarly, if you had some other concept that involved the word Apple, like say, for example, the, 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 the music company called Apple, it would also have um, an overlap between the bitmaps of these three concepts. And the linkage that you observe um, comes from the ability of the brain to iterate through all these different concepts, however they are linked within um, the neocortex. Um, and so now if you, now that I've introduced the main actors in, in my view of the world, uh, I'll try to join them all together. Um, the neocortex is constantly modeling. The, this is, modeling is not something we choose to do. I mean, we've already, we've already read Stakoviak, so we already know that. In general, any human encounter with the world needs model as its mediator. I think that 
the word human is misleading. I think anyone who has a neocortex will, by definition, um, experience modeling. And this modeling will go back down to these notions that we just described uh, from, from Hawking's. Um, and it is the fundamental nature of the neocortex to model in the same way that uh, the, in the same way that the Turing machine, uh, the Turing architecture has got some fundamental properties, the neocortical architecture has also got some fundamental properties. And modeling is one of them. Modeling the observation of patterns and the connectivity between patterns uh, in order to obtain um, some additional meaning uh, is a fundamental property of the neocortical architecture. And what tends to happen with um, the neocortex is soon we start to create models of models. Um, we, we very quickly we exhaust the what we'd call I guess the basic use of the modeling machine, which is such survival. And soon enough we start to construct towers of models. Um, and in a way that is enabled by the language in, in well not in a way. The language is the, the, the way we express those models in a way we can serialize to other people. Um, and participating in the language game means to redefine the meaning of those models across a population that can agree on what those models mean. Um, so it's not just the fact that when I say the word apple, you know instantly what I mean by apple, is the entire experience that comes around learning what an apple is. Sensor, sensor, in terms of motor, sensor motor experience, holding onto the apple, eating the apple, cutting the apple, all these things you do in your lifetime, in your neocortex, there's going to be associations between all of the sensor, sensor, sensoric motoral, um, I can't pronounce this word properly, sadly it's not the same in Portuguese, uh, but all your senses are combined to generate the model. It's not just the case that you're just sensing from your eyes or your fingers, or the models that exist in your brain are very rich and they contain information from all the senses that you have. And that is where the model lies. And there are so um, Hawking's theory is that there's, there are a thousand brains. What he means by that is that the neocortex is composed um, of one cortical architecture, and that, that cortical architecture is then replicated thousands upon thousands of times. Uh, and and it, it's all very, very much the same. So if you were to look at your neocortex, it looks like a sheet and a bit like the size of a napkin, as Hawking always says in his presentations. But if you were to take any individual part of that sheet of, I don't know, say a couple of millimeters, you would see the basic building block of the neocortex, and all of the uh, the rest of the sheet is just copy and paste. It's just repetition of the same pattern. Um, so it, it is fundamentally a modeling machine. Uh, and the reason why we can make these rich models is because we can abstract ourselves from the details that uh, Russell and Wittgenstein on his early philosophy were so concerned about. The models don't necessarily require the precision that um, Wittgenstein, early Wittgenstein, thought they required. Um, we, we can, as an example, we can all say we understand what money is, but in reality, it's actually, from a, from a formal perspective, it's actually very ill-defined. Um, it is very difficult to understand what is meant by money if you try to define it in a formal way. Similarly, most concepts that we've got are concepts that are built upon concepts, upon concepts, upon concepts. And once you try to do a formal definition of anything, um, unless you're talking about something like theoretical physics or mathematics or some extremely specialized field, you'll soon find that formality um, is not possible because at some point you're going to enter some part of the discourse that it has to be hand waved away. Um, and this is not a bug, this is a feature. Um, and it, all this to say that if you would like to have a general purpose modeling machine, you need a neocortex. And you have to abandon formality because it is not possible for you to have um, a Turing-like approach to modeling if you'd like the modeling to be general. That is my first um, conclusion, I guess, after reading this. Um, the second conclusion is um, you're, when you're looking at something like model-driven engineering and when you're looking at programming, more broadly, um, it is important to understand that programming is always going to be an activity that belongs in two worlds. It's always going to belong to the early Wittgenstein and to the late Wittgenstein. I, I don't, I don't agree with people that say that Wittgenstein's philosophies are mutually exclusive. I actually think that they're, they're the two together explain the world. So I think when you think of early Wittgenstein, you're thinking about physics and mathematics, and you're thinking about things that can be reduced to physics and mathematics. Um, 
So for instance, compiler theory. Um, maybe it's not complete, maybe it's not, you know, you can't prove that every program is correct and so on, but for all intents and purposes, you are still in the early Wittgenstein's domain. Most sentences can be proven to be true or false. Um, you are in a very formal way of defining the world. However, um, a program does not always live inside of early Wittgenstein. Uh, let's just call that W1 and W2, so for W1 for early Wittgenstein and W2 for late Wittgenstein. So in the W1 world, um, I see that as the language as we use to express the problem to the computer. But actually, a program has got two, a program is composed of two different um, sets of, I'm not quite sure how to explain this, but a program has, the program is simultaneously a W1 and a W2 program. The reason why is because most of the time we're modeling the real world. We're modeling the world we live in. And as I said before, um, humans are engaged in this language game. So pretty much everything that you try to model, any real problem, would mostly be a W2 problem. Because most of the concepts you're uh, around are going to be W2 concepts. Now you may think, well, I've got a stock, keep, stock keeping application. Why is that not W1 concept? After all, I can do a direct mapping between reality, and by that I mean physical reality, and my, my program. So, I don't know, I could say I have 15 uh, bags in my warehouse. This is either a true proposition or a false proposition. I could go and do a stock count, and if the stock count reveals 15, then um, it's a true proposition, and if it reveals 14, then it's a false proposition. But by thinking um, in that manner, you are ignoring all of the aspects of the domain that belong to W2, uh, including, for example, money. Uh, including all the definitions that go around um, that are, in effect, just conventions between humans. Uh, they are not something you can observe in the physical world. And, and whilst you may think, well, most, m most of the time those things are not very relevant, actually I think it's the opposite. I think because we are inside of the language game, we don't realize how much of the world is um, a construct of the neocortex versus how much of the world is actually observed. I think that the vast majority of the, re the reality, in quotes, that we live in is actually uh, a construct of the neocortex, not, um, not actually real for all intents and purposes. One way to, uh, to try to, um, to comprehend what I mean is to imagine that for a second you're um, a gorilla or uh, any other uh, primate. And if you can observe something, then that means that belongs to reality. The reason why is because the primates are not able to play, at least not fully play, the same language games as Homo sapiens can. So therefore, if, if, uh, if a monkey can observe, observe the concept that you're talking about, then it's almost certainly going to be almost, well, it, it, there's a very good probability it's going to be a W1 concept, something you can make a proposition about and you can reason about. But if the monkey can't observe that, then almost certainly it becomes a W2 concept. And so in this sense, you can see things like borders, passports, uh, money, um, almost everything around us becomes a W2 concept and is in effect a program, and this is how I like to see it, is in fact, in effect, a neocortical program that executes across a set of neocortic, neocortical cores. Those are the participants of the language game. And th that program, whether that program is, say, um, the existence of a nation state or a border, or um, any of these ideas. All these things are programs that run inside of the neocortex. And to be part of a language game means to have the same program as other people. And that, that's the level of modeling that we are doing all the time. Um, now, how do we link all of this back to where we are? Um, clearly, we're not going to be able to make a general theory of modeling that works in the same way as compilers do because the problem, the problem is too open-ended. The problem, in order to create such a machine, the Turing architecture will never be suitable for such a machine, uh, for such a problem domain. Um, the Turing architecture is not designed for a completely open-ended um, a, a way of describing models in general. Now, there's, this is not to say that you could not execute another architecture inside of the Turing architecture, provided that that architecture is, um, you, you can think of the Turing architecture as the implementation level detail, but you can imagine that you can write programs that emulate this other architecture, uh, which could be the neocortical architecture, as Hawking is trying to do. And I think that's fine. I don't think that's a problem. 
because um, it, maybe it's not the most efficient way of doing it. Perhaps you're going to end up spending huge amounts of energy compared to a brain uh, to create a neocortex in this sort, sort of way. Um, but I don't think there's anything stopping you from doing it. However, there's a fundamental impedance mismatch in the way that these two architectures work. Um, and, and that's why I think it is not possible to um, come up with a general theory for modeling in the same sense, because we are straddling between two different, uh, um, two very different realities, I think. So hopefully that makes sense. I mean, um, I'm still trying to work through a lot of these ideas myself, and I would like to write down something about this. Uh, but sadly, um, given that my priority is really um, not that, uh, I've, other than idle thoughts that I've had in spare time, I, uh, I haven't done very much on this. Um, the second topic that I'd like to discuss, which is related in the sense that it's also pretty far out, pretty um, not really directly connected to what we're doing, was um, I was talking to a couple of friends of mine regarding a very interesting article, fairly old as well, so Ian and Indranil, we are discussing this interesting article about Lisp small talk and the power of symmetry. Um, the interesting thing that this article states is the great thing about Lisp is that you can... Well, first it explains macros, which is quite a clever thing. Um, so uh, to, to, to try to enter this topic, we will revert ourselves back to the, the topics we've discussed so far. Um, when, when I said that most languages live in the W1 world, um, more important, even more restricted, restricted than that is their view of whatever it is that their subset of W1 that they're um, dealing with is fixed. So um, if you remember, we discussed uh, models and metamodels and so on. Um, you can conceivably describe a programming language um, as having a metamodel, and those are the set of concepts, the toolbox, if you'd like, that comes with the language itself. So, for instance, the keywords class, if, um, and such, such keywords are what defines a language like C++ or Java or C Sharp. And it is not up to you to rewire the meta model of the language. Um, at best, if your language is very flexible, you can query the meta model of the language, um, but you're not allowed to, say, create a new keyword like class inside of a language like C++ or C Sharp. Um, and so, in a way, these, these are programming languages, but they're set in stone, um, one would like to, to think. However, a language like Lisp is not like that. In Lisp, you can dynamically change the metamodel, and you do so by uh, macros. Um, now, I'm not sure if in the previous chapter we discussed C++ and... Uh, in fact, I think we may have bridged some of this topic because I'm pretty sure we, we spoke about uh, C++ and, and meta modeling and so on, uh, and uh, meta programming. Uh, but nonetheless, so in, in Lisp, you are allowed to extend the meta model of the language dynamically. You can create new constructs, and the parser will automatically pick up those constructs. Um, and to my knowledge, up to reading this article, I never thought there was another language that had that power. The main reason why Lisp is so important, uh, or so dynamic and so clever, is because um, Lisp, in a way, is a programming, programmable programming language because you can dynamically change the language, the meaning of things in the language. And uh, that is possible because in Lisp, unlike most other languages, you don't start with a syntax that then gets translated into an AST, an abstract syntax tree, and then take the AST and then do further processing on it. In Lisp, you start immediately with the AST because the Lisp code is the AST. Um, and because of that, it's very easy for Lisp to manipulate the AST. Uh, normally, in a language like C++ or C Sharp, AST manipulation happens within the compiler. And unless you're a compiler writer and you're extending the compiler, you are not going to manipulate the AST. Um, with Lisp, it's not only possible to do that, it's actually encouraged. And you can think of, of that, uh, going back to our discussion about concepts and models that, of models and so on, you can think of that as the ability to generally introduce DSLs as you go along. Um, so in Lisp, as, as you start dealing with a problem and you start to figure out that there is a more domain-specific way of describing something, you can then start to introduce keywords that are domain-specific, generating a DSL on the fly as you start writing code. And that DSL then gets transformed into a regular um, AST that Lisp can understand. And all of that happens quite 
naturally because of the way the language works. Um, if you were to map this to model-driven um, engineering, um, model-driven engineering is actually proposing that you create these DSLs, but um, the, 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 the generation of DSLs requires you to have a complete stack. In effect, in model-driven engineering, you're trying to create a language. It's almost like trying to create another C-sharp or another C++. And every time you, you, um, you have a new domain, you spend lots and lots of time trying to understand the domain and trying to create these new DSLs and then use these DSLs to model whatever it is that you're modeling. Lisp enables you to move between these two worlds seamlessly. You don't have to create the DSL immediately. You can evolve the DSL. You can observe code and you can say, oh, all this code is trying to do X. And X is the domain concept, X. And then you can create the construct that represents that domain concept. You can abstract that into a Lisp macro. And, and now you can start to program at that level of abstraction. Now, this is very clever because this is how the neocortex works. Um, we all start by building a concept, um, maybe a very low level. I'm going to use the term very loosely here, but a very low level concept. And then we start to abstract ourselves from that concept to further um, general principles. This is what we do with the neocortex all the time. Uh, whether this is connected to offsiders' uh, analogies or whether this is just a property of how the SDRs work, or I'm, I'm not sure. But this is something really, really fundamental. And that's why model-driven engineering people were so um, adamant that we should try to speak the same language as the problem domain experts. Because they, they in their heads, they thought that the impedance mismatch between the the language of the programmer versus the language of the domain expert was the cause um, of, of a lot of the problems, all of the friction that exists in the development software, of software. But then you could say, well, actually, Lisp has already solved that problem. Uh, if only you were to code everything in Lisp, um, then you would be able to just create the DSL, um, evolve the DSL as you begin to understand the problem. Um, and then um, it's quite seamlessly you can move between the two worlds as required. Uh, sadly, and this is part of the discussion that um, myself and Nino had, uh, Lisp didn't really take over the world in the way one would have thought. If if this is this reasoning is correct, you would expect Lisp to be extremely popular, uh, but instead we're seeing the opposite. Uh, the second language that is described in the article is another favorite of mine, um, Small Talk. Now, I, again, I can't claim to be much of an expert of Small Talk. I do recommend this book. This was given to me many, many moons ago by um, my thesis advisor of my master's. Um, and small talk is very interesting. So, so for a lot of us that come from an object-oriented background, we think of small talk as a, a pure object-oriented language. Um, for that, I think you could look at Eiffel. I think Eiffel is probably a slightly purer language. And I've already mentioned Bertrand Meyer, so I, I can't recommend enough. If you have any interest in object orientation, you should really read uh, Meyer reference that book again. Uh, but small talk actually, in some ways, is, is not quite... It, it, small talk goes a lot further than, um, say, Eiffel, at least the Eiffel that I met uh, 20 years ago. Um, in small talk, small talk created, created a completely consistent world. Um, and one of the quotes in this article, which I find very, very interesting, um, which I think we should definitely reflect on, um, this this paragraph really, really, really caught my attention. Uh, I'll just read it up uh, to you. So, uh, in fact, to be honest, that's not exactly what I wanted. Oh, here we go. Uh, this is the paragraph I was looking for. Um, small talk is powerful because all small talk data are programs. All information is embodied by running living objects. Class programming in small talk is simply data manipulating programs very important, that themselves are data. It's the inverse of the Lisp philosophy, but the end result is the same. Uh, it is what enables the small talk debugger to freeze, dissect, modify, and resume programs mid-execution. It's what enables the browser to instantly find all objects that respond to a given message, or all superclasses and subclasses of a given object, or every running instance of a given class. It's why small talk ID isn't just written in the language, it quite literally is the language. This, this is really, really profound, and I think um, it's easy to miss um, this in small talk because we tend to have a, a C-sharp stroke Java view of the world. Small talk, in a way, is um, the logical con consequence of object orientation, and 
they didn't just stop at a little bit of reflection, allowing you to um, query all the superclasses. They created the world in which every time you write small talk codes, it is all equivalent to the existing so small talk code, and you are e extending the universe of discourse of small talk. Um, and I think that really, really connects back to Wittgenstein's uh, v W2, because I think what we're trying to say is these two languages enable you to raise the abstract language level, the abstraction level, at the language level. They enable you to create the DSL within the language itself. And that is fundamentally what we've been trying to do all along with model-driven engineering. Uh, and those two languages have already done it. They've already created all the, uh, what it is required in terms of the building blocks to fuse the modeling process that is so natural to the neocortex with the programming process. Um, because and now, hopefully, I'll do my conclusion, uh, conclusion uh, of, of this very rambly uh, discussion. Um, if you start from the Turing architecture and you've got um, the neocortical architecture, you need somewhere, somehow to translate this in these two worlds. What we do in programming is we create a Turing representation um, or uh, a W1 representation of W2 concepts. And we straddle between these two worlds all the time. We need to listen to somebody talking in W2 and we need to then express those thoughts in W1. And because W2 is a dynamic and completely um, ever-changing process, um, this mapping becomes out of date as soon as it is made. As soon as you freeze the mapping in time, as soon as you create the mapping in W1, W2 moves, because that is the nature of the neocortex, that is the nature of language. As soon as your trader explains to you what he means by um, an oil barrel traded in an exchange, and as soon as you encode that knowledge inside of your program, and you make a statement such as, um, the price of a bio, uh, oil barrel would always be greater than zero, the world has changed. And now, suddenly, there's a negative price for an oil barrel. And now your model is not up to date. And then you have to go and update W1 again, the source code. And then the, the, the source code now becomes, again, out of sync because the world changes again. And, and, of course, I'm giving you a very concrete example of a change, but I don't think that's how you should see it. You should see it as a completely dynamic process. Language is evolving all the time, and language is the model. The model is the things you're talk, talking about. This also explains why it is that you, you can't capture requirements. Capturing requirements is, number one, to freeze time. Number two, um, because requirements are defined in the neocortical architecture, there is no fundamental formal definition of any of the requirements. Uh, all there is is a series of concepts reflecting back to each other. And what you try to do is you try to translate that across the Wittgenstein boundary, as I call it, between W2 to W1. And the very process of translation from W2 to W1 results in information, information loss, by definition. Because W1 is not designed to reflect the concepts that exist in W2. Um, so at best, all you can do is you can obtain this snapshot in time that will already be out of date and, and not quite accurate and it will degrade over time. And that, that's, that's, all, that's the best you can expect. And this also explains why Agile is so powerful, because Agile is the increasing of the velocity of the checking of the translation of the Wittgenstein boundary. You, you spend all the time trying to check, what, did I really understand this concept correctly? Did I really model it correctly? And you spend all the time in this feedback loop. Uh, interestingly enough, it's very similar to the architecture of the neocortex in that way, because you're constantly making a prediction the code, and then you're checking that prediction against reality, and then you're correcting it. So it's the same loop that we see in the neocortex, in the way neocortex models, except is applied to this W1, W2, and the Wittgenstein boundary. Um, so th that's what I wanted to discuss in terms of philosoph philosoph uh, philosophical arguments. Um, that is taken actually most of today's lecture, so I don't think we've got enough time for anything else. Um, I think that's probably going to be it for today. I will. Um, yeah, I think that's going to be it for today because I think there's no point of starting to talk about the concepts. So what we're going to do in the next lecture then, uh, we're going to talk about some concepts in our problem um, problem space. Uh, funnily enough, problem space is one of those concepts, so that's quite recursive. But in our problem domain, which is a problem domain of software engineering. Um, but I 
hope that what we spoke about today explains why it is that there is almost no point in looking for formal definitions of something like a problem domain, uh, sorry, a problem uh, space or a, a solution space or any of these things. Because from a W2 perspective, it is very easy for us to come in agreement in terms of language games as to what the problem space means and what a solution space means or a platform means or any of these concepts. But in terms of a W, this is all in the W2 space. But if as soon as I move from the W2 domain into the W1 domain, and I try to get a formal definition of what a problem space is, I will fail to do so. And that, that's really, really expected, um, according to this philosophical um, modeling or philosophical context that I gave you in this, in this, in this, this lecture. Um, I will, at some point, I'd like to, uh, all of this was very rambly, and I obviously haven't cited anything, or I haven't actually, uh, most of this is explained in layman's terms as well. And I have great gaps in my philosophical understanding of either Wittgenstein or uh, Whitehead or Russell and so on. So clearly there's a lot there to, um, to correct from an academic perspective. But I don't see it so much as an academic problem, actually. I see it more as a, a guidance. It, it is, it, this understanding that I try to convey in this present in this lecture is how I reason about model driven engineering um, and I would like to evolve this reasoning over time and perhaps at some point it will be um, consistent enough or coherent enough for, uh, for me to write something about this but for now that that's more or less where it stands um, so that that's where we're going to end thanks for watching